morning, everybody. Let me add my welcome to Bruce's. I have to say it feels very strange looking out into an empty auditorium here at Deeside this morning. But these are strange and challenging days, aren't they, for us all? And so what a comfort it is to know that we have a faithful God. And isn't it good to be able to connect together in this way this morning and to spend a few minutes sitting under his word together? I guess like most other pastors and church leaders across the world, the rapid spread of COVID-19 has raised some pretty big questions. What does it mean to be church at, at times like this? When online meetings quote, are the only viable option, what will happen to us as a church? In what ways are we going to suffer, not just physically, but spiritually? Well, wonderfully, God is faithful, and that means he is utterly committed to us as his people, as his church. He's committed to being with us, committed to protecting us, committed to encouraging us, and even as we're going to see, he's committed to growing us even through times like these. Months ago, the passage chosen for this Sunday morning was the very one that Bruce read to us, Ephesians chapter 4. And we've decided to stick with this passage today, even though so much has changed. And the reason for that is, as you start to read through the passage, it becomes striking just how appropriate it is. It's a passage about church, and it reminds us that God is in the business of building his church and growing his church. And here's the exciting thing. If this morning we, we read and we act on what God says to us, then the next few months, challenging though they will be, could in fact turn out to be a season of wonderful church growth here at Deeside. As you look at the passage um, from verse Four, following in Ephesians 4, you can't really miss the fact that church growth is Paul's big theme. He's not so much thinking in terms of numbers, but maturity. Look at the language he uses. End of verse 12 there, Paul speaks about building up the body of Christ. That's growth language, isn't it? Verse 13 talks about becoming mature, mature manhood. End of that same verse, verse 13, speaks of growing until we attain to the measure of the fullness of Christ. Now that phrase, fullness of Christ, means being full of Christ, full of Christ's character. It's really meaning Christ-likeness, becoming like him. Verse 15 speaks of growing up in every way into Christ, the same kind of growth language. Then the very end of verse 16, the end of this section Paul talks about the whole body growing and building itself up in love. So it's all about growth. And I guess none of those ideas are particularly new to most of us. That the goal of the Christian life is to grow and to become more like Jesus and that that is Christian maturity. But here's where I think this passage does challenge us. I think we tend to think of growth and maturing as an individual process. So I tend to think of it as my Christian growth. And I imagine I can become like Jesus pretty much on my own. So I need my own particular spiritual discipline so that I will grow individually in my Christian life. But that is not how Paul and the New Testament think about spiritual growth. For Paul... It's all about us growing together. We've already seen in this series on the church that we are one body. That means church is not a meeting I turn up to. Church is a body I belong to. And because that reality is true, it means that no individual part of the body can grow on its own. We are designed by God to grow in community. We need one another. And that is especially true in times like these. Paul presses this point home in verse 16. If you look at verse 16, here he describes how the parts of the body are connected. 
He says the whole body is joined and held together by every joint. Can you see the image? Can you see the interdependence there in the body? We are joined together. That means we cannot function and grow on our own in isolation. No, the whole body builds itself up when, look back at verse 16, end of that verse, when each part is working properly. That's what makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Can, can you see it? Do you get it? As each part does its work, then the whole body grows to maturity. So already it's becoming clear, isn't it, that each of us has a distinctive and vital part to play in the growth of, of the whole church, the whole body. And that is why God has made each of us so different. We're going backwards to our passage really this morning. Um, go back up to verse 7 and verse 8, because here Paul explains one of the ways God has made us different. Let me read verse 7 to us again. Verse 7, But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Can you see what Jesus has done? He's given us different gifts, different abilities to enable us to play our individual role in the body growing. Now notice there in verse 7, he says that grace or gifts have been given to each one, everyone. If you put your trust in Jesus Christ, then he has given you abilities, gifts from him to serve his church. Notice in verse 8, Paul explains how these spiritual gifts were poured out when Jesus ascended on high. Verse 8 is a quotation, actually, from the Old Testament, from Psalm 68. And it's a wonderful image of a conquering king being enthroned after a great victory. And what does the king do then? Well, he passes out gifts. He passes out the bounty to his subjects. And Paul is saying that has been fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Having defeated all evil through the cross, he ascended into heaven. He sat down on the very throne of God. And from that exalted position, he has poured out gifts on his church. Abilities to his people. Now, why has Jesus done that? Well, it's very clear, isn't it, down in verse 12. Why has God, in verse 12, equipped the saints, that's all of us, for the work of ministry? Look at the end of the verse, well, for building up the body of Christ. He's given you a gift and you a gift and me a gift so that the whole body is built up. On a normal Sunday here at Deeside, it's just wonderful to see this process happening. People using the particular individual gifts God has given them to serve the whole body. Gifts in administration, gifts in welcoming, gifts in practical setup, flower arranging, welcoming people as they enter the church building, gifts in sound and multi -music, uh, multimedia, gifts in music, working with junior church, working with the members of the celebration group, gifts of preaching, serving refreshments, offering hospitality, and on and on the list goes. Now clearly times have changed, and the church program here has radically changed. But let me encourage you to be praying, and to be creative, and to keep looking for ways that you can use the abilities that God has given you and entrusted to you so that you can serve the whole body. Why? Well, so that the whole body can be built up and grow to maturity. This church building may be closed, but we don't cease functioning as church, as the body of Christ. Having thought a little bit about the different gifts that Jesus has given us, how we're each unique in that way, Paul zooms in and focuses in on something that every single one of us needs to do. And I want to spend most of our remaining time here. Look down at verse 15. 
Let's read verse 15 again. Paul says, rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ. So Paul begins that verse with the word rather. So it's clear he's comparing the mature church in verse 15 with the immature church in verse 14. Now, what what does verse 14 say about this immature church? Well, we know it's vulnerable. It's tossed to and fro. Words there indicate it's easily deceived. And Paul there is using language of the street musician who who cons you again and again and again. Now, that might be fun for a little while. So he's got his three cups set up on a table and he says, well, where's the little furry ball? And he says, well, it's here. (laughs) No, he says, it's not. Well, it's here. No, it's here. That might be fun for a while, but imagine living your whole life being duped, being blown around, actually believing things which just aren't true. That's the immature church, verse 14. But in contrast, the mature church, well, that's a stable church, even in times of crisis. Why? What does verse 15 say? Because they are speaking the truth in love. Now that phrase has become a little bit of a joke in recent times. It's become an excuse for saying all kinds of unkind things. Oh, but I said it in love. But the truth Paul speaks of here is gospel truth. It's truth about Jesus. It's truth about who he is. It's truth about what he's done what that means for us, what he's done in the past, what he's doing right now in his world, what he will do in the future. So the mature church takes that truth seriously, and Paul says it speaks it to one another. Isn't that striking? So truth is not a private matter. Paul doesn't imagine us hearing the truth on a Sunday morning or hearing God's truth in our private devotions and keeping that truth in my little mind and my little heart, keeping it to ourselves. No, we speak it to one another. And he says we speak that truth in love. In other words, Paul imagines a church community where we care enough about each other that we want each other to grow and to grow towards maturity. And so what do we do? We talk about Jesus with one another. And as we do that, the whole body grows and builds itself up in love. We may not, we we will not all be upfront Bible teachers, but we are all called to do this, to teach one another about Jesus. Normally that will be an informal thing, encouraging each other, reminding each other in these very uncertain and worrying times of who Jesus is, that Jesus is present with us, that he loves us, that he cares for us, that he will provide for us, and reminding each other of the hope we have in him. That is speaking the truth in love to one another. And when that happens, the end of verse 15 happens. We grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ. Now, we can't meet up in coffee shops as we used to to do this. We can't meet up in each other's homes as we used to. But we can find ways of doing this, of speaking the truth of Jesus to one another in love. We have to find ways of doing it, whether that's by a phone call or an email or a WhatsApp group or Zoom conference calls or whatever it is. The home group that Rachel and I are part of has a WhatsApp group, and it's been so encouraging to see group members doing this. Speaking the truth in love, sharing Bible verse after Bible verse, sharing God's promises, encouraging each other to look to Jesus and to trust Jesus. And it's been been encouraging. It's been powerful. This morning, the prayer group that I'm part of met via Zoom. We had a Zoom prayer time. And part of that was not just praying, not just sharing our needs, but actually talking about Jesus and his words and his promises. And guess what? It built us up this morning. 
So let me urge you to do this, to start doing this, to keep doing this, to keep speaking the truth of Jesus to one another. As each of us plays our part, God says he will grow us as a body together, even through these difficult and challenging days. Isn't that a beautiful possibility? Of course, there is a sobering flip side to all of this. If I don't do what Ephesians 4 is calling me to do, then it's not just me who suffers. We're a body. So my individual behavior, my lack of activity, has implications for the rest of you, and vice versa. We are not spiritual islands. We belong together. We're interconnected. That is the nature of a body. I have a friend who used to play rugby, and uh, some years ago he injured his thigh muscle. But he he decided to ignore it and keep on playing. But because that particular muscle wasn't working properly, his knee got destabilized, and he developed knee ligament trouble. Oh, well, he thought, I'll uh, buy a knee bandage, and I'll just keep playing. But because his knee wasn't working properly, and he was running in a funny way, he soon tore the ankle ligaments. Now, that didn't discourage him either. He bought one of those strappings you can get, and he put it round his ankle and kept playing. But because then he was favoring his other leg, he strained the other set of ankle ligaments as well. And then, well, then he stopped playing. Now, we laugh at that because it's so obvious, isn't it? If one part of the body isn't working, the rest of the body cannot get on properly without it. We know that. And here, the Apostle Paul is reminding us that the same is true with the church, the body of Christ. If I fail to do my bit, if you fail to play your part, we hinder the growth of the whole body. Whereas, verse 16, when each part is working properly, well, that's when the body grows and builds itself up in love. I think we can sum up what Paul is saying in two very simple and very easy to remember statements. Firstly, each of us is needy. If I am to grow as a Christian and not be immature and stunted in my growth, I need you. I need other Christians. Because God has gifted them in different ways to me for my good. He's given me other Christians. He's given me you so I can be taught. I can be pointed back to Jesus. I can be encouraged and helped. So the question is, do I, do you have that sense of need to actually make the effort to tune in to the WhatsApp group, these Sunday sermons, Jeremy's very helpful devotions, the video conference calls, whatever it is, because the reality is each of us needs to be connected to have other Christians minister to us and talk about Jesus with us. We are needy. But secondly, each of us is needed. Now, some of us instinctively react to that. Well, not me. I'm not needed. I have nothing to offer. I guess the question I'd throw back is, well, do you believe the word of God? Because Ephesians 4 is so clear. God has gifted me. God has gifted you. He's gifted each of us, made us who we are for the sake of other Christians. Each of us is needed. And again, the question is, do we have that sense of responsibility for one another? I found it easy this week to think that there are so many in our home group that it wouldn't really matter if I didn't join, didn't connect with that Zoom meeting. But the truth is, God has gifted me, he's gifted you to the other Christians in your home group for their good. You are God's gift to them. They need you, they need your support and encouragement, they need you to talk about Jesus with them. Each of us is needy, each of us is needed. One final question, which is certainly on Paul's mind, it might be on your mind, very briefly. 
what's the role of pastors then in the growth of the church? Because Paul mentions them clearly there in verse 11. He mentions them uh, among other gifts as he highlights specific particular gifts. Verse 11, he, that's Jesus, gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers. Now, why does he single out those gifts? Well, they have one thing in common, really. Each of those gifts bring God's word to God's people. Very simply, the prophets and apostles received God's word, the gospel, by revelation from God. And they made it known. That's how the church was established. That's how the scriptures were established. And then the evangelists and the pastor teachers, well, they make known what has been revealed by the apostles and the prophets. And for Paul, the key thing is that this is where the process of church growth begins, as God's word is taught and proclaimed. I guess it's no surprise to us that the catalyst for growth is the word of God. As we hear God's word taught, then we turn to trust in Jesus As it continues to be taught, we start to learn what God would have us do, how he'd have us change. And so God provides pastors and teachers for the church to be a catalyst, to initiate this process of growth. However, although growth may begin with Bible teaching ministries, it will only continue when there is a response from the entire church body. And so Paul follows verse 11 very, very quickly with verse 12. Look at the impact of the Bible teaching in verse 12. Well, God's given pastors and teachers, verse 12, to equip the saints for the work of ministry. Can you see what Paul is saying? The pastors are not given to the church to do all the work of ministry. No, 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 the pastors are part of the church, given to the church to equip the whole body to do the ministry that Jesus has uniquely gifted and equipped and called you to do. The catalyst is the teaching of God's word, but that gets the whole body doing its bit. So when the Bible is taught, it doesn't function as a lullaby putting the church to sleep. I hope that's not happened this morning. It's meant to activate It's meant to drive us to do things. So when you and I hear a sermon and think, boy, I need to do something. I need to change something. I need to make myself more available for others, to serve others, to encourage others. Well, then the Bible is doing its job, preparing us to do what needs to be done for the sake of the whole body, and then the whole body builds itself up and grows. I hope we've got a sense of the whole sequence of Paul's thinking in this, in this passage. Step one, Jesus has given the church pastors and Bible teachers. And the purpose of that is step two, to prepare all of God's people to do the unique particular things that God has gifted us to do. And the effect of all of that service, step three, the whole body is built up and grows and grows to maturity. You know, it, if what Paul has said is right, and it is, if the role of Bible teaching is to prepare God's people for works of service, then it may well be that this morning God has been speaking to you and me about the service he would have us be involved in today, this week, in the coming weeks. Maybe God is saying to you, now is the time to stop being passive. Now is the time to serve, to serve others. Now is the time to encourage others. Now is the time to speak the truth, to talk about Jesus to others. Let's determine as a church to do more of that with one another this week. And wouldn't it be wonderful if God grows us to maturity as a church in this crisis? He can do that. But if that is to happen, it will be a shared responsibility. It will not be the work of a few. It's the work of us all. 
Let's pray together, shall we? Let's pray. Lord God, thank you that you have given us everything we need for life and godliness. Even in times of crisis like this, you've given us your word, you've given us your Holy Spirit. Lord, you've given us one another. Father, we pray you'd help each of us to play the part that you've called us to play. The part that you have uniquely gifted us to play in your body. Would you show us what you would have each of us do in these coming days? In order that we might grow into the body, the mature body you long for us to be. We pray you'd continue to watch over us in these days. Lord, we pray you'd protect us. We pray you'd give us your peace in these worrying times. Thank you that you are our refuge and strength and ever-present help in times of trouble. Lord, help us to run to you, we pray. Help us to rest in you. Help us to take moments where we are still and we know that you are God. We do pray too that you would help us to be light in the darkness in the communities around us. Lord, we thank you for connecting us together in this way this morning and we now commit ourselves and one another into your loving care. Go with us into this week. Be all we need you to be, we pray and we ask it in your name. Amen. God bless you this week.